Hello, my name is John Sloan. I'm the Executive Vice President for Not So Secure USA. I want to thank you for joining this exciting, extremely informative webinar through an attacker's eyes, your web applications. Before we get into the heart of the presentation, I want to first highlight who we are. Not So Secure is an intricate part of the Clarinet cybersecurity practice. Clarinet, our parent company, is one of the largest managed service providers in Europe and abroad, focused on modernizing and running critical applications and infrastructure 24 seven for our customers. The Clarinet cybersecurity practice has over 20 years of experience in cybersecurity services and training for some of the biggest brands across the globe. We are one of the largest training partners of the globally acclaimed Black Hat Conference, where we train hundreds of participants in cybersecurity every year. What differentiates us from our competitors in cybersecurity is we hack and we teach. Our teachers are our hackers, enabling us to provide the most researched and capable penetration testers in the market. As teachers, our hacker training program encompasses training that supports beginners, which are individuals with little to no security experience all the way up to advanced to include advanced infrastructure hacking and advanced web hacking. We also have specialized cybersecurity training focused on DevSecOps and hacking and securing cloud. This webinar is an introductory to our five-day advanced web hacking training course. At the end of the webinar, we will provide additional information on how and where you can attend our advanced web hacking course. As hackers, we provide white box and gray box penetration testing services for your business application, excuse me, business applications and infrastructure cloud and mobile environments. Additionally, we provide successful black box red team security assessments where we leverage our hacking expertise to find vulnerabilities that vulnerability scans are not able to identify. This wraps up a little bit about who we are. And now without further ado, I welcome Drew Shaw, who's going to give us unique hacker insight into our advanced web hacking training course. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Please feel free to submit questions via chat throughout the session. We will gather all questions and present them back during Q&A. Also, before I forget, I do want to have a, I do want to let you know about a prize draw to attend our next live delivery advanced web hacking, which I will address at the end of the webinar uh, in terms of how to take advantage of this great opportunity. Drew? Uh, thank you so much, John. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is Dhruv. A little introduction about myself. Uh, I'm the technical director at Not So Secure, and uh, I will be taking this webinar about what uh, web application vulnerabilities and the course that we've developed. Uh, a little detail about myself. Uh, I have written two books, uh, Kali Linux Intrusion and Exploitation and Hands-On Pen Testing Using Verb Suite. Both of them are published by Packet Publishers. My specialization is in mobile, web application, and network security. Uh, I've delivered this training at multiple different locations, including Black Hat, Hack in Paris, Texas Cyber Summit, NordSec, et cetera, and the list goes on. The idea of this particular course is to give understanding to technical pen testers on how the applications need to be assessed and how to find esoteric vulnerabilities. So why am I here? The aim is to basically give you an understanding of how the world revolves around upskilling yourselves when it comes to security. When you look at most of the application level vulnerabilities, right, they usually are focused around the top 10 categories of OWASP. From the defender's perspective, a lot of application level defense basically relies on efficient development and making use of automated scanners. Now, if the defenders are already using automated scanners, most of the bugs will already be fixed by them then what is the attacker left with? Because normally the attackers, they would do an analysis by going through the application, uh, make use of scanners, and then try to see if they find vulnerabilities and use a few business logic flaws. We aim through this particular course to show you some interesting scenarios that we've encountered in our real pen test engagements from neat new to ridiculous uh, bugs that we found. And all of these are a part of this course. So when we design this course, there are a few things that we take into consideration. The topics for the trainings that have been handpicked based on the following criteria. One, the vulnerability should often be undetected by automated scanners. If they are, then this is the course in which the content will go. Twisted bugs in our day-to-day -day pen test, something that basically makes us scratch our heads. How is that even possible? That's something that we focus on few amazing bug bounty reports. So when we come across bug bounty reports and we feel that, hey, this is an awesome uh, attack people have done, everyone should have access to practice this particular bug and understand the complexity of it. We put it in our course to ensure that attendees get the best of it. We have sophisticated business logic flow attacks also a part of our course. Now, 
here is the gist of the syllabus. This is part one. Uh, the syllabus is of two pages. So we cover attacking authentication, single sign-ons, password reset attacks, business logic and authorization flaws, XML, XXE attacks, uh, breaking cryptography, remote code execution, tricky file upload followed by SQL injection, service site request forgery, attacking cloud environments, um, attacking hardened CMSs, web cache attacks, and miscellaneous vulnerabilities. Now the ones that are highlighted in yellow are the ones that I'm going to give you a glimpse about of how we do it in our training, right? So the topics that we'll be taking is SAML authorization bypass, XXE in file parsing, authentication bypass using .NET machine key, .NET serialization attacks, SQL injection to cryptography, and SSRF exploitation. The session will take around an hour, and then we will have a QA session after that. So let's dive in. Uh, the first topic of discussion is attacking SAML or authentication. Now we all know what SAML is. SAML is basically security assertion markup language. It is a SSO based authentication mechanism where there is one server that manages the authentication of a user and there are multiple other servers in the backend which are applications that rely on this authentication server to provide access to resources. Now SAML is a XML based format and this particular SAML XML document is Base64 encoded. So in order to decode the uh, packet or in order to decode the message, you'll have to basically use a Base64 decoder and have a look at it. Now, before we jump into the technicalities, it is always important to know the basics, right? So this is how the workflow is. Let me just quickly use a laser pointer. So we are the users of a particular environment. The service provider is a web application and the identity provider is the actual server that authenticates a user. When you look at a normal process, a user visits a website. All right, so the website says, okay, you need to authenticate yourself in order to access resources. And it sends a backend request directly from the service provider to the identity provider saying that, hey, um, I am a member of your ecosystem and I need to authenticate a user. Can you please let me do that? So the identity provider validates the, the application and says, yes, please redirect the user to this particular page. So the user is redirected to the uh, uh, authentication server. Now the authentication server, the user provides the credentials and on successfully providing a correct username and password, they are given an XHTML form, which is encrypted and it contains the identity of the user. And then the user is asked to redirect that encrypted form, uh, to redirect that Base64 encrypted form, encoded form to the service provider. The service provider validates whether the value is correct and it uses the signature, uh, signature mechanism to validate whether the tampering has taken place or not. And on verifying whether it is correct, it will basically fetch the target resource and show it back to the user. So this is a straightforward process. Now, when we normally look at this and we, when we talk about bugs or ways we can exploit it, we think about what are the different things that we can change. So this is a simple SAML response. So if you see, it contains the destination of where the request is going, the issuer or the authentication server, then a signature, which is redacted out here. Signature is basically to ensure that the data is not tampered when it is sent to the actual web application. And the most important thing out here is the email address. Now, if you see here, the email address is sunil at the rate not so secure .com. This is the user that has authenticated himself on the authentication server and this is the identity that will be processed on the application under what basis under the pretext of validating the signature that this document has not been tampered by the user the most common attack type is where a user can simply tamper the SAML response and send it to the service provider and replace the values of the assertion released by the idp such as username and email so in our case if the attacker simply replaces this name with the victim's name and if the weak SAML implementation does not verify the signature, then the attacker will be able to get access to the other person's account. Now this obviously is a very straightforward flaw and this does not satisfy as a criteria for our course, but what does? Something like this. So let's say there is a scenario where if you change the email ID, the application validates and says that, hey, tampering was detected on the document, cannot let you access that particular user. What do you do then? In that process also, there is a bug that attackers can leverage. Now, there's a feature called as canonicalization. 
canonicalization is a feature that allows the uh, the parser the xml parser i'm just going to go back to ensure that irrespective of how the values are represented let's say instead of destination id is written first instead of issue instant destination is located here and the order is jumbled it doesn't matter if the order is jumbled as long as the information is same there is no extra word that is added to this particular text the signature will remain the same and that's what canonicalization does it ensures that the signature remains same irrespective of the order of representation but it will change as soon as a new value is detected so we are going to bypass uh, or we are going to leverage this functionality to bypass the login functionality and another thing to consider is the xml parser returns the last child node that is if you pass multiple values to an xml parser it will only take the last value for that particular key value pair so how do we perform a canonicalization attack canonicalization if you see here by default ignores spaces and comments while creating the signature so as an attacker instead of sunil at the rate not so secure let's say that the original user is not so secure user at the rate by backlab.com if the attacker injects a comment like this using the comment syntax and any random text inside it and closes the comment syntax what will happen is the canonicalization feature ignores the spaces and comments which will keep the signature intact and it will say yes the signature is correct please proceed to log in the user not so secure this is a comment user at the rate for backlab.com but when it goes to the back end the xml parser gets three different values not so secure as text one the second is a comment and the third is user at the rate for backlab.com and because xml parser role usually ends up taking the last value of a particular node it will end up allowing you accessing user at the rate for backlab.com which is the victim user let's have a look at the demo so i'm going to play the demo now what you see out here is an actual lab that we have created in our in our entire environment so what happens is uh, everything that you see all the bookmarks that you see are all real uh, real world simulated applications that we have created in a secure vpn environment for attackers to practice and exploit different types of bugs and these are fully functional applications where you have all features including selection of products to payment gateways exploiting payment gateways and going beyond right so let's have a look now this is a top-up application where you are allowed to purchase top-ups we'll see how this functionality goes so there's a sign in with one login option so i use that one login functionality and from top-up i am redirected to the identity provider that is one login.com now i provide my username and i provide the password for the actual user now not a john is my account but my victim is john at the rate backlab.com so let's see after the login is successful now since we are getting redirected i will capture a burp request and if you see this is the base 64 encoded response now i'll take this into saml where it base 64 decodes and this is how the value looks like and if you see the name assertion that is not a john webacklab.com is the id to whom the resource access is to be given i'll send a copy of this to repeater and what i'll do is i'll try to change to john at the rate webhacklab.com let's see how it works so first not a john is the correct user so it says true now let me edit that particular field i'll say john at the rate webhacklab.com now if you see it validated and it said hey there is a signature mismatch there's a change in the context i cannot let you sign in now let's see what we can do with this so we go back we leverage the canonicalization feature and add a comment because canonicalization ignores spaces and comments and if you see it said okay john robac lamb is a correct user now we can simply view this in the browser by simply requesting in browser and pasting the request in the browser so i'll drop the original one and i will push in the one that gave me a success response and boom we are logged in so you see how a small functionality because of using default configurations an attacker can use these methods to bypass this and automated scanners will not be able to find these now let's hop on to another one xxe that is file in file parsing now we all have played with xxe vulnerabilities right but 
what we've done is we've always played it with environments where we see that the request contains an XML content type. Now here's something interesting. You can also perform XXE attacks in a file upload functionality containing a very specific set of file types that are allowed to be uploaded. Now open document format is an XML based file format and there are many members of this ODF and the most famous ones being DOCX and PPTX document files presentation files and Excel files are used numerously in all the applications that you come across in your day to day pen tests. These files are nothing but a collection of zip files because and they're represented by the open document format. So this knowledge gives rise to the possibilities of exploiting XXE bugs in file passes. So what a user can do is a user can find out if there is a particular value from a document which is being read by the application and shown back to the user. How? Like for example, something like this. Let's say there's a simple uh, document file. The attacker can open the document file, access the XML content, edit the values and see whether they are being reflected on the application that processes that particular document and shows the response on the web application. So inject the payload, upload that document and view if the application is vulnerable to XXE or not. Let's check this out, shall we? So there's another application called a shop.webhacklab.com, which is a shopping website where you can purchase products. Now within this, there is a functionality. So let's access the career functionality. It says enter your first name, last name, mobile number, email address. Um, you can spam in any values. And let's say I want to upload a doc file. So I'll go to a doc file called as resume.docx, select a few values and click on upload. Now, if you see here, details uploaded successfully and in the top left, there is something that reads title, my title has been added. Let me show you what's happening. Let's, let's do an analysis of understanding where did this my title come from? Let's go back to the response and let's check the value that we got. So we'll go to the response. And if you check it out, it says title my title has been added. So we'll go ahead and have a look. Now the resume.docx file that we uploaded, as I said, it's a part of an ODF format. You can open it in a VI editor and see the entire contents. And this is nothing but a collection of XML files. Now what we have to do is find out which particular file was that from where it fetched the content and in our case it is core.xml. Now within the core.xml if you see there is a node called as DC title my title. So this is the place from where it took the value my title and showed it to me on the screen. Now since th these are nothing but XML files you can actually push in your XXE payload within this particular document and instead of my title you can reference the variable in which your content can be stored. Let's check this out how this can be done. So I have another file called as resume2.docx and if you go back to the core.xml you'll see that there is a xxe payload within which there is an xxe variable doing an external entity reference by the keyword system and fetching the content of etc pass wt for the linux system and then it is being called in the dc title node as a variable reference okay so we'll go ahead and we will upload this document and see what happens so let's quit let's close this let's go back to our browser let's go back to the career section Fill in some details. Mobile number, provide an email ID, spam a few LinkedIn and Twitters. And upload the resume2.docx. Fill in some details and upload. Now, if you see the resume uploaded successfully in the, in the back end, title 
and it referenced the content of XXE variable that we have created and it showed you the content of etc pass wt right so if you if you go to burp you can check out the values as well so you go back to the responses take the lost value check responses let's scroll to the bottom and here's your entire content of etc pass wt for reference right so this tells you that even if there are file upload functionalities and you come across um, file types like docx xlsx pptx and if the application is reading the content and displaying it to you on the screen you must try out xxe attacks in file upload functionalities too right so classic different attack vectors which we have in our class i'm sure you guys are gonna love it um, the other interesting one is something that we do in our research so not so secure does a lot of research and we come up with our own set of tools and we share them with everyone in the insecurity industry one such tool is something that we released when we came across a dotnet machine key authorization bypass now before we jump into the authentic uh, authorize the authentication bypass of machine keys let us first understand what machine keys are now machine keys are basically keys used in dotnet environments which are used for providing encryption and decryption functionalities of form authentication cookie data view state data etc in dotnet environments what you do is in your web config file you specify a machine key which looks something like this where you have a machine key you specify the validation key and the decryption key and you give the algorithm types as well what are the different things in dotnet that are uh, dependent on machine keys you have authentication tokens web resource script resource view state csr of tokens password reset tokens role cookie membership passwords etc now here's what will happen let's say there is someone a developer um, who has to meet their deadlines and is creating a web form a web form is something where you have to host multiple servers containing the same application fronted by a load balancer to ensure that the application is distributed evenly and the cpu utilization is managed properly and the application works flawlessly now if a developer simply gets let's say five six different servers hosts the application on all of them and starts putting it behind the load balancer when an application when a user accesses the application the load balancer let's say chooses either one of the servers what will happen is every server by default will have a different machine key because the developer has not specified that beforehand now because of that what will happen is the second request or the third request will simply fail because the decryption token is different for a different server which is behind the load balancer in that case the developers what they will usually do is they will go to the documentation of the authors of that particular service so let's say someone says hey i'm having trouble shooting the form authentication because it's giving me an error now here's the common mistake that kind of made us realize that a lot of people fall into the trap carefully read this out if the scenario involves a web form which is multiple web app, uh, multiple servers hosting the same application behind a load balancer then machine keys should be same across everywhere this is the information knowledgeable part the mistake use below machine key to maintain the consistency on all the servers of the farm what a developer will do is because they don't know what this really does they will they will get an idea that okay this is for encryption decryption i'll just take this key and paste it on all my servers after doing that it works flawlessly this is the first option the second option is which we all use stack overflow Let's say someone came up saying that, hey, I'm having problems with an anti forgery token in .NET. What should I do? It's like, hey, you should specify a machine key in your web config. Check this out. Check this as an example. And there are so many people who have upvoted, which means a very high possibility where a lot of people simply copied this information and pasted it in their web servers. And if you look on GitHub, there are almost 200,000 results, which is a huge number. Now, what if I tell you that we basically created a tool that scans for machine keys which are exposed on the internet and creates a repository of it and then we use that tool to basically break into applications without even testing the application yes that's right because if an attacker gets hold of these machine keys 
the attacker can create his own authentication token and access the application. It's that scary. Let's check it out with an example. All right, so this is something that we have in our course and let's check this out. So I go to another application, which is admin.webhacklab.com, which is the back end for the top up and the shop application. Now let's do some recon along this application. I check this out and I see that there is a dot ASPX auth cookie. There is a request verification token and there is an NSS temp token. Now I know because I already told you that ASPX auth cookies are created with the help of machine keys. So let's check this out. So there's this ASPX auth cookie and this is the cookie value. Now let's send this to repeater. We're going to play with this and now let's check this out. So what I'll do is I will go to one of the utilities that we have created. So we go to the utility.webhacklab.com where we have created a utility called as blacklister. Now this particular tool is basically the tool that collects all the machine keys from the public environments and creates a repository of it while you're testing a dotnet application and see how easy it is to attack. So let's go to generate playload in blacklister. The first thing that you have to do is paste the cookie. What it will do is it will check whether it has a key in its database that is able to decrypt this value. If it is able to decrypt this value, it will come forward and say, hey, I was successfully able to decrypt it and you should check this out. So let's fill in ASPX auth, the default validation and the default decryption algorithm and click on decrypt. And the blacklist tool was able to find the decryption key, the decryption algorithm, the validation key and the validation algorithm as well. And since we were just logged in as a normal anonymous user, you can see that the user data is the user is anonymous. Now, if you wanted to create a valid cookie, what do you have to do? You have to ensure that you go ahead and provide a valid user name. So let's first search that. So what we will do is we will first go ahead and try to find a valid username. I try anonymous anonymous just out of guesswork, but obviously that doesn't work. I try different name combinations and I see I try to see if it works or not. It doesn't. But somehow this application gives an error message when you give a valid user but a wrong password. So instead of saying invalid user and invalid password, this particular scenario where I said admin, it said the password is invalid, which means that the user is valid. Now the second dependency to do this attack is you need to know a page in this application that requires authentication so that the ASPX auth cookie will be fetched for validation purposes. So let's check this out. What happens next? So you can to use tools like directory buster, go buster, etc., or you can navigate commonly known folders to see if there are any pages that require authentication. So I'm trying images, I'm trying home, and now if I check out home about it redirects me to the login page and it says that I need to provide the login data in order to be able to go ahead and access the data. So let's see what happens next. I go back to my blacklister utility. I click on edit the cookie and I say, hey, I found out a username that is admin. So please create a cookie for the admin user. You see how dangerous this is? When I clicked on encrypt, it created a data for me. This is the cookie for the admin user. Now what I will do is I will try to access the home about page, intercept the request in burp and simply replace the cookie with the one that I have created and forward it to the application. And when you look at it, wait for it, there you go. You're logged in as an administrator. You see, I didn't even pen test the application just because the developer accidentally copied a publicly leaked dotnet machine key a tool like blacklister which we've published with our research can be leveraged to do this type of an attack so you see um, let's say you want to see uh, different details like let's say you want to see users of this particular environment you simply replace the cookie and you can fetch all the user data the contact number, the lockout time, membership, is admin features and everything. So this is how an attacker can leverage 
uh, machine key bypasses right so it's a very interesting concept again automated tools will not be able to figure this out it's all by your skill sets that you need to develop or upskill yourself in order to find these types of attacks then we come to insecure deserialization in .NET. Now, what is serialization? We've all seen a lot of serialization things happening on the internet. Serialization in a dictionary explanation or a dictionary definition is a means of translating data from one form to another just to send it across the network or to store it in a particular file format. So when you look at this diagram, serialization is a concept where you take an object, convert it into a stream of bytes so that it can be sent over the network, stored in the database or stored in a file and later retrieved to be converted back from a stream of bytes back to the object. Now, usually the textbook definition doesn't ring a bell, but I have a very good example for this. Let's say, for example, you're playing um, FIFA with a friend who is like in a different country altogether or in, in his own house. Now, when you're playing this game in the back end, there's a lot of serialization and deserialization that is happening. How? Let's say you selected a player who has the football and now the player is running few steps forward and then he dodged a person, then went few steps to the right and then kicked the ball towards the goal. Now the process of walking few steps forward dodging a player, moving a few steps to the right, and then kicking the ball towards the goal. These are all different objects. So what will happen is all these objects are converted into a stream of byte sent over the network to the other player whom you're playing with in real time. Convert these stream of bytes back into the object, which means the first object converted is the person has the ball. The second object converted is moving few steps forward. Then the third one that is dodging the person, then the fourth one moving to the right, and the fifth one kicking the ball towards the goal. And the process goes on, right? So you'll be able to map. Now, what was the problem because of which deserialization attacks became prominent? The reason deserialization attacks became prominent because the other end had no idea which method is going to be called the player could have moved left instead of right. Then there would have been a method of left in the stream of bytes. So the deserialization endpoint has to rely on anything that comes from the other end because it is an unexpected input. And because of this unexpected input mechanism, the attackers can create their own set of payloads trying to access some other features which should only be accessible to a developer instead of the user of that particular product. And that's exactly what deserialization attacks are and they lead to remote code execution. So serialization is everywhere. If you see almost all the languages have support for serialization. You have Java, you have PHP, .NET, Ruby, Python and all OOP based languages. Almost all of them have had bugs in deserialization routines which resulted into remote code execution and few of them have blatantly gone ahead and said hey i'm sorry you were using our library but we are not able to fix this because we did not anticipate this type of a problem and this is not patchable please stop using xyz method of our service because we are discontinuing support instead use these other alternatives and because developers or security people don't usually keep a track of all the platforms to understand what are the different methods that are vulnerable things often go undetected and if you look at this there were big organizations that were vulnerable to deserialization vulnerabilities you have uh, weblogic cold fusion jboss websphere joomla machento oracle enterprise docker and a lot more or even apache log 4 j so Let's talk about .NET. The .NET framework has multiple serialization types. You, the top serialization methods are binary serialization, runtime, uh, or also known as runtime serialization, XML and SOAP serialization, followed by data contract serialization. So these are three different types of serialization methods. We will be looking at binary formatter, which is the most famous or the most commonly used binary serialization mechanism in .NET. 
binary formatter is a dot uh, is a class library for binary serialization in dotnet environments it is fast lightweight and a very effective deserialization library that has been extensively used this has been present in the dotnet environment since the initial version 1.0 and this is how a binary serialized data looks like. So this is a sample code just to help you understand where you take a particular value like this is a sample data and you serialize it. This is the serialized output. Now the reason why we put this slide is to show you the actual pattern you should always look for. Any binary dot net uh, serialized data will look like double A E A double a d followed by a few slashes this is the signature of detecting binary serialized data in dot net and once you pass it to the deserialization function it just converts the object back into the stream uh, it just converts the stream of bytes back into the object so there is a utility that is available on the internet it's an open source utility which is called as wiso serial dot net wiso serial is basically uh, originating from java so uh, a very famous researcher called as Fronihoff had found a lot of deserialization vulnerabilities in Java environment and after taking inspiration from that there were a lot of people like Soros Dalili and a few others who decided to come forward and do the same sort of research in the .NET environment and they were surprised to find so many different serialization methods that were vulnerable to deserialization attacks. So they came forward and created this particular tool called as Viso serial.net and it only works on Windows since it requires uh, the dotnet libraries or Windows core libraries and there are a lot of gadget chains available inside this uh, and for a long different range of formatters. Now what are gadget chains gadget chains are predefined templates of the process or the navigation path which you need to uh, go through. Uh, simply put in simple terms. It's basically like you have a class which you have access to as a user But because you know the back-end process you find inherent classes To reach to a point where there is a particular class that allows you to execute OS level code in order to navigate that you create a particular um, Set of series of steps to reach to that particular method and this series of steps is basically converted into a template so you simply provide the command that you want to execute and this particular gadget chain will create that take that template formulate your command and push it inside the template so that you, you can use it as a payload let's have a look at it as in the example so i go back to the admin application and if you see we checked out aspx auth right and we did see nss temp but we never knew that it could be vulnerable but now when you look at the pattern it reads double a e a double a d followed by a few slashes which means this is a binary serialized data so how do we go about playing we go to the viso serial dot net all right now we've developed a course in such a way that even if you do not have a windows system we have the utility created as a web application so you can leverage it and then later down the line create your own setup in your environment to play with it all right so we'll be using the binary formatter and what we will do is we'll try to take a simple out of band call so i'll say i want to use i want to execute powershell and i want to use the module of powershell called as invoke web request and pass in a particular url where i want the request to be generated so i give the ip address of my system in the vpn environment and i say generate now if you see the dollar env is nothing but the environment variable so it's going to try and fetch the environment variable username and then send me a request to my attacker control system so this is the payload that we have i'll take this payload and I will go ahead and start one Python listener because I might be I'll expect a connection request coming back where it requests for a particular environment variable username which gets executed on the remote system. So let's replace it with our payload and click on send. And if you see the user that was running the particular command or the particular web application that ran the command is win 2k12 IIS. And that's how you get an auto band call of the user. Now, why should we stop here, right? Because hey, we are pen testers, we are bug bounty hunters. Why don't we try to find out 
if we can take a reverse shell. So we've taken a simple um, reverse shell in PowerShell where we give our IP address and the port number in which we want the terminal to come back to. A uh, simple uh, client server communication executing OS commands. So this is the payload that is generated. I'll take this and I'll go back to the application and first Let's configure the tunnel. So I'll create a netcat listener on that particular port and now I will go ahead and fire the payload. If the payload executes successfully, I should have a reverse shell. Interesting. So if you see, we got a reverse shell and now I can execute commands. Right now the idea to understand is Always keep an active eye on everything that the application communicates. Even if there is a particular cookie value that makes no sense, try to dig deeper and understand what it is, what it is used for, how does it work, right? Because that's that's the thought process that we try to cultivate when we do our training courses. It's not just the tips and tricks. It's also to try and figure out how the application works, what are the possible test cases that you can look at, and how the different ways you can create your own business logic attacks or find certain bugs that are often undetected by automated scanners. Then we come to SQL injection through cryptography. This is a very interesting attack vector, and this is something that we actually experienced in one of our pen tests that we were doing. Now, when you look at third party interactions of any organization, let's say there's an e commerce application that has a payment gateway integration with them. What they will do is they will first go ahead and share between each other a symmetric key or a encrypted key that ensures that any sensitive data that goes from the e commerce application to the payment gateway is encrypted because it contains credit card information and a lot more other information. So if you see here, for example, a transaction flow would look something like this. Step number one, initiate the payment process. The user fills in the credit card number, the CVV details, the phone number, address, and click on pay. This information is sent to the e-commerce backend in step number two. Now the e-commerce backend, because it has a pre-shared key between them and the payment gateway, they will take this key, encrypt this information, and say, that and give it back to the user saying that hey user please take this encrypted data and pass it to the payment gateway so the user takes that data redirects to the payment gateway the payment gateway completes the transaction and then you get redirected back to the e-commerce application now this is an endpoint where encryption is used now if i was to ask someone to pen test this particular endpoint the best that people would do is try to see if they can replay a particular blob but you can't perform a full-fledged SQL injection, IDOR, or any other vulnerability test case in this particular situation. Now, in that case, what would happen is usually the test cases would exhaust. But a very interesting thing is that because of the most famous term, human error, there's a very high possibility a developer might have accidentally used the same key for some encryption or decryption function within the application because maintaining two different keys becomes a difficult task. Now in that situation, if the attacker is able to find any other endpoint that accepts clear text values and returns encrypted values, then the attacker can take that endpoint, create all the malicious payloads for their test cases, and then take these newly generated payloads and test the payment gateway. So you see, it is possible to pen test cryptographic endpoints as long as you have complete knowledge of the application and if you are able to find an endpoint that takes plain text input and responds with encrypted values. Now, with that said, in SQL, one of the most important thing is how to exploit blind injections. So I will be showing you a scenario where we are doing a cryptographic attack over a blind SQL injection. All right now before we jump into that just wanted to give you a little context blind injections are often difficult to find because the application does not reveal much information about the application's response now different sql platforms like mysql ms sql they all have different inbuilt functions which can be used to identify and exploit sql injection vulnerabilities one example in ms sql 
is master.sys.xp underscore dir tree. Now this particular stored procedure is actually used for listing files and directories on system or even on a remote system. So if this process or if this procedure is accessible to someone who is able to perform a SQL injection attack, then they can make an out of band call using a pre built function that is supported via the MS SQL platform. So what the attacker will do is uh, in this particular cryptographic attack, the attacker will capture the initial request and craft multiple different requests or different payloads and receive their encrypted form and then send these encrypted data to the second application or the other endpoint and perform the attack. Now one interesting thing that I usually tell a lot of people out here. If you are pen testing the same organization and there's a very high possibility that there would be a same developer between multiple different applications hosted. So if you find this bug across one application, you can simulate this bug across all the other applications because there could be a possibility just to save the headache of maintaining multiple keys. The person might have used the same keys at all the platforms. So let's go ahead and check this out. So the first process is to identify a clear text input returning encrypted values. So here in this case, if you see, we are going to a top up functionality and applying a voucher code. Let's say I just give a random voucher code, uh, code called as test one to three and try to see the data. I'm just going to ensure that I capture all the response. So the request that I'm sending is with the code test one to three and there's a signature to protect that endpoint against brute force. And the response that I get is a base 64 encoded value which might be encrypted or might not be. Um, let's push this to decoder and if you see it's not making sense which means that there's an encrypted value that has been encoded. So I'm like all right. So this is an endpoint that accepts clear text input and gives me a response of an encrypted string that is base 64 encoded. All right. I'll make a note of it move forward. So then there's a payment gateway you make the payment and you enter a spam card number you enter the month cvv year etc and pay now i'll wait for the transaction to complete now here's the interesting thing normally when you perform an only the application scan what will happen is you end up scanning and URLs that are available via hyperlinks. That's how the scanner spiders everything and tests everything, right? But there are many applications that generate new links only after a process has been completed. Like, for example, this only after the payment process has been completed, there's an email that is sent to the user that contains a link that is vulnerable to SQL injection. So let's check this out. All right, so this is the order. Now what I will do is I'll go to my email and it says payment received and order confirmation. So payment received it gives you the details of the payment and the transaction ID. And in the other one, it gives you the order confirmation. View now. So when you click on that, there's a new link that is generated and shop order transaction ID is equals to encrypted value. Okay, so let's push this encrypted value to the repeater. There's another value that is generated again. There's another request get API order transaction ID. Interesting. So we'll send this to repeater as well. Now what we will do is we'll turn the intercept off. We have two endpoints that accept encrypted values. Now I'll use that endpoint that accepted plain text input and give me encrypted values in the return and I will test it across these two different APIs. So I'll give a simple MS SQL command to go to sleep that is wait for delay and I'll give it let's say five seconds. Okay. I click on apply. I capture the request. Um, my intercept was off. So I'll just go to the responses proxy history and the request wait for delay and the response for it that is this particular value. Now I'll take this value and spam it across both these endpoints that I have found in the email functionality. Let's go to the first one. And let's paste this. 
if you look at it nope it responded within 0.5 seconds that's too fast maybe my payload was wrong or maybe it's not vulnerable let's move to the next one and then conclude what the output is or what our conclusions are so i'll paste it here i'll click on send and it's gone in a waiting state interesting and if you see in the right hand side at the bottom it responded after five seconds five one six two milliseconds which is approximately five seconds so this this means that the endpoint is very likely vulnerable now what i'm going to do is normally we use burp collaborator for auto band calls right but here we actually show you in our course how you can actually capture things at your uh, by on your own server so what we have is in our environment we've created our own servers where we can capture for auto band requests so the attacker will start a tcp dump listener on the dns port and then create auto band payloads and try to fetch results All right so let's see how this attack works the tcp dump is configured now we'll create new payloads to send out of band calls via the dir tree stored procedure and fetch some data so the first thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to validate whether an out of band call is possible or not and this is a unique web domain that is made available to each and every user so that they can leverage out of band calls so this is the first payload where we are fetching an out of band call for user10.babacklab.com that is me this is the payload that is generated i'll go ahead use this payload and push it in the vulnerable endpoint and click on send and i get an out of band call which means that this endpoint is vulnerable to a cryptographic sql injection cryptographic sql blind a uh, blind sql injection right so this is how that particular thing works now going forward you can actually leverage this particular information to retrieve information that way with what are the permissions that you are uh, running sql commands what are the different roles that are av available to you and what are the other ways through which you can enable certain functions and take out of band calls so we write sql queries in a structured manner to store variable uh, info into a variable and then use that variable as a subdomain name of user 10 or the unique domain name dot com and extract out of band calls so we teach you all in this particular class as to how you can make that how you can write your sql scripts how you can extract information and how you can even try to take reverse shells via blind sql injection then we come to the last one that is cloud attacks now again uh, we we basically cover the web application side of things in our cloud in our uh, web application attacks so anything related to web application and cloud we try to cover that in our web hacking class we also have an extended class which is hacking and securing cloud infrastructure that teaches you everything outside of web applications as well as to what are the different vulnerabilities in the cloud hack cloud infrastructure so in that class we cover aws azure and gcp and all the other segments in which cloud hacking takes place even within the web application related side of things and other services of cloud offerings this one what we will do is we'll be looking at ssrf attacks in cloud environments now we all know what are the key premise of cloud computing right because it is very comfortable easy to use and minimum manager, man, management required people prefer cloud it's decentralized rapid provisioning there's remote access minimum management reduced it hardware cost and it's flexible and scalable now because it's easy a lot of people use it but for people like us who are into security why do we need to make them aware of it because first point major organizations are pushing for it cloud services as a pen tester is equals to shared infrastructure model which is shared hosting protected by a virtual environment and because different services are made available there are multitudes of offerings which means there are different test cases for each and every service one of the biggest problems in cloud environments is the misconfigurations misconfigurations can increase a lot of threat and an attack can result into loss of data productivity as well as huge monetary loss by means of unauthorized softwares running under the account like someone just manages to get a high privileged key and they start crypto miners 
my my that's going to be a very big bill to pay to the aws use uh, owners because someone managed to break into our environment for example code spaces code spaces accidentally ended up being a very tricky situation where someone got hold outside their organization a very high privileged key and they leveraged they tried to take this key and you know get ransom from code spaces but things went south the attackers panicked and they deleted everything that code spaces owned in the aws environment and it could not be retrieved because it's a shared infrastructure model and the resources once deleted cannot be recovered and because this happened they had no data of themselves they had no data of the clients and they had to shut their shops so it's important to take into consideration cloud security now we have a cloud responsibility matrix it's a simple way of categorizing things where you say what is the responsibility of the user and what is the responsibility of the provider so you have on premises infrastructure as a service platform as a service function as a service and software as a service so in the class we explain in detail what is infrastructure as a service platform as a service function as a service and software as a service but for now the matrix is that as the higher the service you take the less job of maintenance you have to do the service provider takes care of more and more things the way you keep scaling towards the services that they provide now one important thing in the cloud environment is the metadata api this is what the attackers try to access what is a metadata api a metadata api is an ip address a non-routable ip address which can only be queried from within the resource that you own in the cloud environment that tells you the data of your uh, instance like for example uh, how long is the server up what is the dns name what is the ip address configuration who's allowed to access this server what are the identity and access management keys everything is a part of metadata api aws google azure all of them have them now how can an attacker interact with the metadata api if the application is vulnerable to ssrf or if the application is vulnerable to code execution now ssrf was vulnerable in gcp and AWS Azure was already protected by the help of a metadata head, a header called as metadata true in CSRF attacks uh, in SSRF attacks an attacker cannot inject a custom header so Azure was protected against SSRF attacks GCP was vulnerable till v1 beta 1 was in place but recently they just disabled this and now they are completely using v1 which is protected against SSRF attacks however unfortunately AWS is still vulnerable to an SSRF attack and if the application is vulnerable to code execution then they can perform an attack directly so what I'm going to show you next which is the last case study uh, is the attack that everyone performs in our environment where there's a simple developer who creates an application without knowledge of security in an AWS environment and ends up getting his whole application and the AWS environment compromised all right so we should be done shortly it will take us five minutes more so the case study is that there is an ssrf application uh, ssrf vulnerable on an application hosted in an elastic beanstalk instance what the attacker does is the attacker gets the metadata details there's no direct access to s3 bucket so they enumerate further and they found out the account id and the region where this was hosted on doing that they were able to find out the s3 bucket and then they downloaded the source code of the application and they found out there was a CI CD pipeline, which is a deployment pipeline. And using the deployment pipeline, they were able to push their own backdoor into the live application. And basically, it did complete compromise. Summit Route had done an extensive research. We've given a blog around them as well. Uh, they've identified more such naming mechanisms which allow us to strengthen our research. So let's check out the last demo for the session. So this is an application that is vulnerable to SSRF. And if you see, there's a SSRF URL, uh, there's a normal URL doc parameter, and it says, oh, you use cloud computing, you must be so secure. So let's go ahead and check one thing. Now there's a page called as server status page, which is not accessible publicly. It can only be accessed from an internal system. Right, so if I wanted to check for SSRF, what I would do is I will capture this request and try to access the server status page by editing the value in the doc parameter to localhost. So I will go ahead and say HTTP colon slash slash 
and give the IP address. All right. All right, so IP address and then server status page and click on send. So I'm able to see the server status page. Now I'll access the metadata API that is 169.254.169.254 and I'll try to access the data. Now if you see I'm able to access the APIs. So what I'll do is I'll try to reach to the IAM keys uh, or the IAM endpoint which contains the identity and access management keys. So if you see I'm navigating through these endpoints, I have security credentials. Click on send AWS Elastic Beanstalk EC2 role. Now this is the default role that is created, right? There are no changes made. It's a default role. And if you see these are the keys that are available. Now what an attacker will do is the attacker will simply take these keys and use them in the AWS CLI. Right, we should be done soon. So they take the CLI. All right, so I'll just fetch one more data that is required to successfully communicate. That is the region where it is hosted. So we go to the dynamic endpoint instance identity. I'll just forgot a slash out there. There you go. And document. And here is the region US East one. I'll go ahead and configure the environment. So we have AWS CLI installed. I'll just create a few environment variables should take some time. So I'll say AWS access key ID. I'll paste that value. Then I'll push in secret access key. And then I'll go ahead and push the token. All right, let me just copy this and copy and paste. And the last one is the region. So I'll say export AWS default region. And that was US East one. Now to verify whether the credit, the key that I have is correct. I will simply say AWS secret token service get callers identity and it will see whether this IAM has a role or not. So it goes ahead, take some time. And it says yes, your account number is this and this is the role that you have that is Elastic Beanstalk EC2 role. When I do an AWS S3 bucket list, it says access denied because you don't have permissions. Now usually attackers get stuck out here, but because they are not aware of the naming convention, they cannot go further. But as I said, there were different ways in which people found out naming conventions. This is one of the ways that you can use. So you have to say AWS S3 LS uh, S3 Elastic Beanstalk hyphen the region hyphen the account number and then press enter. This will give you the S3 bucket that is associated with that particular IAM, whether it exists or not. So you go into the C, uh, SSRF. Uh, let's just have one folder in which we will do this attack. So I'll say MKDIR SSRF test and within this I will try to download all the content of this particular S3 bucket. So I'll simply say copy and in this particular folder recursive enter. And it should go ahead and download everything. Right, so if you see it's downloading a bunch of stuff. Now, if you go ahead and list it, let's go ahead, check this out. There's a file called as document.php, which is exactly the same file which we found in the application that is vulnerable to SSRF. So this zip file is nothing but a staging environment zip file. Interesting. And when we downloaded the stuff, we also saw that it is a CI CD pipeline, right? When the downloads happen, it showed it was a CI CD pipeline. So what we will do is we will take a web shell. Uh, all right, and we will put it out here and push it inside the zip file and upload the zip file back to the server 
and then go to the application to see whether the web shell is uploaded or not. All right, so this is the step that is left. Let's check this out. So I appended the file and I simply say AWS S3 copy this particular zip file back to the S3 bucket and enter. Now, once we come back to the prompt, the file should be executed. So let's try to access the web shell 007. All right, so I'll say web shell 007 and I'll hit enter. Not found. Here it says it has been uploaded successfully. Now the thing is when you use a CI CD pipeline, it does not happen immediately. And this is what pen testers often miss out. It takes some time for the CI CD pipeline to execute. So you'll have to wait for a few more seconds to check whether this works or not. So I try again, not accessible. Try again, not accessible. Let's try one more time. And now that you see, our web shell is accessible and I can execute commands here itself. So I say if config cat etc pass wd and I have all the output. So I've successfully uploaded a web shell in the default application in AWS vulnerable to SSRF. It can be that crazy. So it is always important to take care of cloud environments as well and take into consideration the IAM keys and the permissions that you grant on that when you're hosting an application in cloud environments. With this, I complete all my demos just to give you an idea of how our course is designed to specifically focus and help pen testers and bug bounty hunters find the right track, get the right mindset, and understand what the different test cases that can be done without the help of automated tools. So with that said, I'd like to hand this over back to John who can take it over for the training dates and other information. Yes, true. Thank you. And I know we're pressed for time. You know, before we get into a quick Q&A, as previously mentioned, this webinar is a precursor to our five-day advanced web hacking training course. These next few slides provide a list of our upcoming remote training courses and informative webinars. Uh, following this webinar, we will be providing additional information via the email that you have provided. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, there is a special bonus for attending this webinar. Just by speaking to one of our team members about your training or pen test requirements, you can you can become eligible for an opportunity to win a free place at our next live remote delivery advanced web hacking training course. Uh, to arrange your call and gain entry to the prize draw, please email us at contact at notsosecure.com. I think that's on one of the slides, yep. Um, and as a reminder, we hack and we teach. If you're in need for or have future needs for cybersecurity risk assessments, we would be super grateful for the opportunity to perform a risk assessment on your behalf. We look forward to speaking with you in the near future. Thank you. I'm now going to hand it over to Ryan for some quick Q&A. Ryan? Yeah, thank you, John, and thank you, Drew, for the presentation. Uh, I know I personally learned a couple of things in there, so I'm hoping all the attendees uh, felt the same way and learned something new. Um, obviously, we have all run a little bit, so we've got time for one quick question. Uh, Drew, so the question we've had come in is, is this applicable for bug bounties, or is it focused only on pen tests? Um, so this course is designed to focus both on bug bounties as well as pen tests uh, but the idea revolves around the fact about uh, how you can find bugs that are usually not detected by the automated scanners. Uh, there are certain test cases which we have deployed in our environment that are special bug bounty cases where uh, the impact is increased even though the vulnerability is low. So yes, it is focused for both pen testers as well as uh, bug bounty hunters. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, so we have had another question coming as well, but what we'll um, go, I might as well just fire it through quickly actually as well. Um, so if this training is five days, um, do we get time to practice afterwards? Um, yes, so what we've done is uh, we've, got, we've create, curated this environment in such a way that we give you as much as good information within five days and also let you practice in those five days itself. But there could be time because you know it's information overload. You could be in a position where um, you're not able to catch up with the other topics because you know it was just information overload. So we give you an extra 30 days of class to go ahead and practice everything and we also provide you an extended support where you can reach out to us via email or other mediums of uh, contact and we will help you give you walkthroughs again and we also give you an entire student pack which contains the slide decks the answer sheets the cheat sheets the steps to do the attack the different learnings from each and every attack as a giveaway in every course 
Great, thank you for that. Um, that is all the questions we've had in today. Um, obviously, if you do have any other questions, we will be sending out um, this slide deck and this recording to you all tomorrow. Uh, so you can reply to the email address in there or any, or any other way if you want to get back to us. Um, also, at the very end, there is a quick survey, which we will be delighted if you could fill out. It's just a couple of questions regarding uh, the webinar you've just watched and future webinars as well. Uh, so again, thank you again to Drew and thank you to John uh, for running that presentation. Uh, thank you, obviously, thank you all for attending. We um, do have a follow-up webinar next week on the 7th, which we'll be delighted for you all to attend again, uh, which is very similar as well. Um, so yeah, thank you all for attending and thank you again, yeah. Thank you all. We'll hope to see you soon. Thank you all. Have a great day ahead.